Atlantic Coastal Acidification Network. I'm Grace Sava. I'm an assistant professor at Rutgers University and ocean acidification innovation lead for the Mid-Atlantic Regional Association Coastal Ocean Observing System, or MARACUS. Um, I'm co-leading the development of MACAN with Katie Goldsmith, who's project manager at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Council on the Ocean, or MARCO. She's in attendance today, and together we can take any MACAN related questions at the end of today's webinar. The MACAN region runs from New York, south of Long Island, to Virginia. Our region is bordered by the Northeast Coastal Acidification Network, so NECAN, and the Southeast Ocean and Coastal Acidification Network, or SOCAM. While MACAN has just recently formed, we have established a steering committee and an expanding regional membership. So we are very excited to have all these members now. Um, we have organized the first series of monthly webinars, so today is our first one and establish network objectives. We aim to develop a regionally relevant education outreach engagement strategy and information website, provide an information hub to share acidification resources in the Mid-Atlantic, provide an information hub to connect researchers and share research, provide a forum to share best practices in monitoring and sap sample collection, develop a list of regionally impacted species and identify regional research gaps and also to help address the Mid-Atlantic Coastal Ocean Action Plan's Healthy Ocean Ecosystem Action Number 3. Our first webinar series consists of a set of four webinars, including today's, that will occur on the third Tuesday of every month. The second webinar will take place on January 17th and will cover acidification impacts to Mid-Atlantic ecology. Uh, the third webinar will take place on February 21st and will focus on perspectives from industry, and webinar four will be on March 21st and will focus on perspectives from natural resource management. Um, we also are planning our first workshop. The tentative date is May 9th, which will be held likely in Annapolis, Maryland. So stay tuned for details um, on that workshop, how to register and any additional information for that. The goal of that workshop is to determine data gaps and high priorities for research in the Mid-Atlantic region. We will have two presentations today. The first presenter is Janet Reimer, a postdoctoral fellow under the mentorship of Dr. Wei Jun Tsai at the University of Delaware. Her research is focused on CO2 observations from mooring platforms off the coast of Baja, California, the South Atlantic Bight, and the Mid-Atlantic Bight, and identifying sources and scales of variability and annual air sea CO2 budgets. The second presenter is Jeremy Testa, an assistant professor at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science at Chesapeake Bay Biological Laboratory. Jeremy's research integrates field observations and experimental data with biogeochemical hydrodynamic models to examine interactions between biological, chemical, and physical processes in coastal systems. He is currently working on a project focused on the interactions of eutrophication and acidification in Chesapeake Bay. During the presentations, all of you guys will be muted, as you know. However, we do encourage you to ask questions using the question box. These questions will be addressed during the 15-minute Q&A period at the end of both presentations. We also encourage you to answer two short poll questions that will be asked while we are, while we are switching between speakers. So there will be one in just a few minutes and then another one between Janet and Jeremy's presentations. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the MACAN website once it's up. Um, it is currently under construction. Um, it'll be midacan.org. Um, speaking of which, thank you to those who have volunteered to be on the MACAN website working group. We really appreciate it. We are still in need of a few more volunteers to help with both the website design and content. So if anybody's interested, please contact me or Katie. Our emails are on the slide um, if you would like to be part of that project. So without further delay, I will pass the baton over to Janet. Um, I don't have the I don't have the option yet to share my screen. All right, while we're while we're waiting um, for that, if everyone can please respond to this quick poll.
looks like about 25% of you have voted. We're going to give it about another 20 seconds. Why? What are you most hoping to get out of your membership in the Mid-Atlantic Coastal Acidification Network? All right, Janet, I've changed the presenter over to you. Um, are you sure about that? Yeah, I can try sharing it with you again. Yeah, that would be good. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so I'm going to be talking today about just some quick questions that we have regarding ocean acidification in the Mid-Atlantic Bight. First is, what data do we have and what are the ongoing projects? What do we know at this point and what do we need to know? So the first thing I want to talk about are easily searchable data sets that also happen to be publicly available. There at the moment, there are three, and I know this because I spent quite some time Google searching. And so for the first one, we have the Oceans Margins Program, which is uh, back in, in the early 90s. And if you want to go to Google and search for that, you can very easily do so by the um, keywords I have in quotations for each of these. So, And the other two would be um, Gulf of Mexico, carbon, East Coast Carbon, which was uh, one and two were done in 2007 and 2012, and then the most recent is the ECOA East Coast Ocean Acidification Cruise. Um, these cruises uh, covered quite a bit of area. Um, oceans margin, ocean margins program. Uh, we have CO2, surface salinity, and surface temperature, and there were a total of nine cruises that covered four seasons. These are only available at the moment through the Carbon Dioxide Information Analysis Center. Then with the GOMEC 1 and 2, we uh, continue to have CO2, uh, surface salinity, surface temperature. And then we have uh, discrete water column and surface samples for pH, as well as other carbonate system variables, including alkalinity and inorganic carbon. Then uh, in the summer of 2015, we continue to have pH, CO2, salinity, and temperature, and the same uh, carbonate system variables that we have from the GOMEX. Now, the important thing to note from these uh, cruises is that they all have CO2, and that's something that I will come back to in a few minutes. And the, like I said, these are easily searchable and available online. There are plenty of other cruises, we just don't have them publicly available at this time. So what can, what can uh, cruises, cruise data tell us, and why do we really care? So the first thing that we're going to look at here are um, some CO2 data and pH data uh, in the Mid-Atlantic region, which is in this black square, but really focus in on some relationships where we have high CO2 and relatively low pH. So throughout the Mid-Atlantic region, we can also see that there's high spatial variability. Um, these this is uh, an example from ECOA and it was over the summer. This is really um, probably, it's a week period that we were able to cover this region and then there's some more spatial coverage in here uh, from a second week. But what I really want to focus on is not only this high spatial variability, which um, we believe is not only due to the Chesapeake and Delaware Bay influence, but also other water masses. Um, with with the PCO2 data, we can draw this relationship um, from uh, to pH, and that's very important because pH is not only a, a data variable that's understandable throughout uh, the stakeholder community, but it's also something that we as scientists can use in conjunction with PCO2 to calculate other variables that are essential uh, ocean acidification indicators. So to continue along uh, with this example, again, going from pH, we can see this lower, more acidic pH uh, has implications for low aragonite saturation states. And this 
the aragonite saturation state is essentially a, a measure of the potential for dissolution, and that's really what we're considering to be acidification. So any value less than one, which we're only slightly approaching in the mid-Atlantic region, mostly up in the northern part of the mid-Atlantic region, is where we would expect um, any calcium carbonate mineral to start to dissolve. So as we travel through the mid-Atlantic, um, again, this idea of spatial variability is very important because our region seems to be, at least in, with respect to aragonite saturation state, more variable than the, 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 um, the northern region, which is covered by our friends and partners at NECAN, and the southern region uh, by our friends at SOCAN. Sorry, CCAN. SOCAN, CCAN. I'm sorry. I did confuse So once we're able to look at um, spatial data uh, in the surface, we can also look at spatial data through the water column. And one of the important things, again, about the Mid-Atlantic Bight is that we're interested in the characteristics of the different water masses that occur. Because as we go from north to south in this region, different water masses have different influences. So one thing that we're always very aware of is that there's a cold current that um, runs from its uh, extension of the Labrador current. And within these colder waters, we tend to have um, lower CO2, um, I'm sorry, lower pH, and then lower aragonite saturation states. And when we look at these changes in the water column and changes in the spatial distribution of aragonite saturation state, we're concerned with what's going on close to shore or close to the coast, where the majority of our economically important species are. So it's very important to not only have an idea of where these water masses are uh, having their influence, but how these water masses are changing over time. So that's just a really quick overview of what we have and what um, that data is telling us. And then uh, Grace went through and, and did a compilation of other projects that we know of at the moment that are going on or that have taken place. So the first one is um, NOAA funded, and it's a marine resources monitoring assessment and prediction program, as well as Northeast monitoring program and an ecosystem monitoring program. These are um, historic data sets now that um, we will be using in the future as part of synthesis programs. Another one is the Ocean Observation Initiative, uh, which again is ongoing, and this is a great program. Just we're kind of waiting for their data to be up and accessible. Uh, then we have uh, EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, is always an important participant in regional and local scales. They've participated in several. Uh, carbonate chemistry campaigns, and they have another one planned for this summer. And the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection has also been very active in carbonate um, data collection. But even more important is that we will be able to, uh, coming up very soon, use other data to help us empirically test uh, carbonate data. So we can use old data and data that isn't carbonate chemistry to predict carbonate chemistry. So that's, that's a very exciting um, project on the horizon. All right, so as I said, the next thing we want to talk about is what do we know? At this point, we're looking at data sets that are relatively short term and are snapshots of regional spatial variability. But we don't really know very much about longer term changes. Uh, anything on seasonal to decadal scales, we just are guessing at this point. Um, unfortunately, some of the earlier studies, such as the ocean, mar ocean margin programs, were not conducted with ocean acidification in mind, so they may not have collected carbonate chemistry data, but that's okay because, as I said, we can use older data, create empirical models, and then we can start to look for trend, longer term trends, and essentially now, even with our limit, relatively limited data sets, we're able to kind of come up with an early detection scenario where we are able to predict terms, uh, sorry, uh, trends. 
So again, using just a snapshot to look at variability, this is an example of some data that was collected from the ECOA cruise. And we were lucky enough, and it was really just by chance that we repeated uh, a large section between the, um, between the Delaware Bay and the Chesapeake Bay. So this gray line is the cruise track from the end of June, and then the background colors here are um, uh, interpolated from a greater spatial coverage during the second half of the cruise, which occurred about a week later. You'll notice that around the gray line, there's uh, different colored dots in the background, and so that represents the CO2 pH and the uh, saturation state of the first part of the cruise. Just, the, just over approximately 10 days and you know, a 25 to 50 microatmosphere CO2 change induced a pH change and then a change in the uh, saturation state. These changes, they, this, um, so this is submitted, I'm sorry, to um, JGR Oceans and the authors found that these changes were mostly due to uh, physical changes in the water columns from freshwater, the mixed layer depth, and then biological processes, which were likely induced by the physical changes. The questions that we that arise from this data set will include: uh, Is this natural? Is this background? Is there an anthropogenic portion? Um, is there more influence from offshore than we are presently aware of? So while we're able to look at the short-term variability and see what potential uh, there is for change, we're just not sure at this time if this is something that's anthropogenically produced, if it's a natural background cycle, if it has anything to do with tidal cycles as well, because these data were not collected at the same time. So we really don't have a good handle on time scales. Um, so, and then I want to bring in this example from Ocean's Margins Project, which uh, gives us a water column structure going from north to south. Uh, there are six different transects here that go all the way through the Mid-Atlantic by region. And one important thing to note is that this New Jersey transect down here it has is, was repeated uh, during the COA trans during the. Uh, GOMEX and, and the ECOAs. The GOMEX didn't have the spatial coverage that ECOA did. But it's nice that we have this data going back to um, the late winter, early spring, while the other cruises are looking at uh, summer data. So just using the New Jersey transect here as an example, we can definitely see that water column structure is different. We don't have, um, sorry, so we're looking here, this middle one is the uh, pH and this bottom one here is the pH, the New Jersey transect. So we don't, even the, the color uh, bar is different, but we can still see that these values here of a pH around 8 are higher than these values here of uh, 7.8, 7.7, sorry, 7.8, 7.9-ish. And it's very interesting because we still see this deep water here that has the lower pH, but this, while the pH in the top of the water column is higher on both for both cruises and, and different seasons, there's just not this marked difference between surface and bottom. So this influence of different water masses is likely not only important year to year, but season to season, and at this time, we still have questions about the different proportions of influence from different bio biogeochemical processes that are occurring within the Mid-Atlantic Bight. So basically what I've told you is a small amount, we, we know little, and we need to know a lot more. And we can look at seasonal to decadal changes, the determination between natural and anthropogenic cycles, and the influence of various water masses by continuing our direct monitor monitoring through cruises and autonomous sens sensors. And I think one thing that I didn't quite get in is that there is going to be, uh, the new project was funded using gliders um, that's going to 
Grace is on that project. And so that's going to start, I think, this coming year. And that really gives us this opportunity to collect vast amounts of data to add to our synthesis. So over the next few years, we'll be synthesizing um, data that goes back to oceans, margins, and anything else that we come across. So we're going to be using those data to form these one-dimensional time models that we can also bring in uh, empirical models to, to test um, how well our time models are, are um, giving us, I'm sorry, we want it, we're using the empirical models, the empirical relationships to test how well our time models are doing uh, in estimating change, longer term change over time. Because as we know, uh, and the atmospheric change is directly affecting uh, surface change, but we just, we're not exactly sure exact, uh, how much at this point. So I think the take home message in the Mid-Atlantic bite uh, off the coast is that while we do have vast amounts of data, we just haven't had the opportunity to synthesize it yet. And we do know that there are uh, projects that will be filling in gaps in our knowledge in the upcoming years. So I guess now I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy to take us into the estuaries. That's, that's where I end. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to run the next poll. So if everyone, um, while we're transferring over to the next speaker, could please answer this question really quick. What are the assets that the Mid-Atlantic Coastal Acidification Network most brings to the topic of acidification? Please just select one of these options. All right, it looks like about half of you have voted. We'll give it a little bit longer. All right, I'm going to close the poll and share the results with you guys. It looks like most of you feel that the Mid-Atlantic Acidification Network provides a nexus for exchanging questions and information. Now I'm going to change it over to Jeremy. Jeremy, if you could unmute yourself. OK. Great. Well, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Jeremy Testa. And I'm at the Chesapeake Biological Laboratory. And I've spent most of my time focusing on nutrient cycling, oxygen cycling, and other aspects of biogeochemistry. And um, I'm somewhat of a newcomer um, to this field, and it's been interesting. And sort of a along those lines, um, I think today I can talk about um, a lot of the monitoring that's been going on in estuaries, much of which has not been focused on the carbonate system or the acidification problem but might present some opportunities um, to make some gains on that front um, pretty quickly with some synthesis. <clears throat> and I want to thank a number of people who I've now acknowledged here that have provided slides or some information that are relevant to this talk, especially in trying to accumulate the various efforts related to OA monitoring that are occurring in the Mid-Atlantic. So as most of you know, in this region, um, there's a series of big estuaries like Chesapeake Bay and Delaware Bay and Long Island Sound, um, but which have strong salinity gradients and strong depth gradients. But there's also a lot of other interesting systems, such as the coastal bays along the New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland coast um, that are shallow, more lagoonal. Um, and so there's a sort of a diversity of, of different environments um, in the that are estuaries on the, in the Mid-Atlantic. And also, because this is a Google Earth map, you can sort of get a sense of the population centers um, along the 95 corridor that exist in the Mid-Atlantic. So there's a lot of people and a lot of um, external pressure from the watershed on the dynamics of all of these systems. So I wanted to start by sort of contrasting some, some of the aspects of the acidification problem in the estuarine zone 
um, and how they might contrast with uh, the shelf. So one thing, as I just mentioned, is that, and I'll talk about a little bit, is that there's many routine monitoring programs that already exist in estuaries, but they haven't emphasized the OA question. A lot of them were set in stone to address the issues of nutrient pollution, um, oxygen depletion, um, and other issues. Um, because estuaries are um, where land meets sea, um, there's a, several land-connected platforms for monitoring that are common in estuaries, and they've provided a wealth of um, high-frequency data. Again, not necessarily focused on the OA issue. Uh, eutrophication is especially strong in estuaries, and especially the Mid-Atlantic, as I said. So, you know, looking at the balance between this eutrophication signal and the more fossil CO2 signal from the ocean is a key question in these systems. And then you have things like strong salinity gradients and, and different types of habitats that sort of complicate um, our understanding of these systems. So in estuaries, you can just think of wetlands and seagrass communities, um, various benthic reefs, um, turbidity, and so there's a lot of different factors at play. And lastly, the sediment water fluxes, because estuaries tend to be shallow, can be an important component of, of the overall dynamic. So I'm going to sort of try to highlight some of the monitoring that exists in the Mid-Atlantic and then focus a bit on some select results that are mostly focused in Chesapeake Bay. And I guess that brings my bias, but also sort of the information that I had at my hands. And I'm going to, I've characterized these different types of uh, monitoring as sort of what I call agency-based monitoring, which is the sort of continuous long-term records that have been gathered by agencies like EPA and NOAA and the state resource agencies. And then what I've called investigator-based mo monitoring, which is where um, scientists have deployed sensors in some cases to sort of routinely um, capture dynamics and then what I call investigator-based research sampling, which is, you know, crews and research-specific activities that have resulted in data that, um, when accumulated, provide a lot of information. So I think some of you are familiar with a lot of, with a lot of this, but I wanted to sort of highlight it. So on the left here um, is a map of the Chesapeake Bay uh, monitoring program that's been in place since 1984. And so this um, you know, there's hundreds of stations in this program, and they've been visited at least at the monthly scale for the better part of three decades. It's a wealth of information, um, and as I said before, it, it wasn't focused on um, OA, so um, while pH was measured in these systems, um, there, there was little else um, relative to the carbonate system. Um, and similarly, there was um, a lot of monitoring in nearby Delaware Bay um, that started with some of the state agencies um, and that John Sharp's group picked up to do regular monitoring, again, sort of amassing multi-decades. Um, and while pH was usually measured in all of these systems, um, the only other sort of aspect of the carbonate system that was measured was alkalinity. And so there are some opportunities to use these two parameters to try to estimate other parts of the carbonate system, and certainly folks have done that. So there's also um, a lot of monitoring that's happened in a lot of the New Jersey waters, and so these are just some snapshots of Barnegat Bay sampling and sort of the overall sampling from the state of New Jersey. And so these are similar to the Delaware Bay and the Chesapeake Bay examples, um, but in this case, there's some continuous um, sensors, some real-time sensors that have been deployed and there's an effort underway to have one of those sensors that can measure aspects of the carbonate system be deployed um, soon. So the other um, agency-based monitoring piece I wanted to highlight um, was the Maryland Department of Research, um, Natural Resources uh, Continuous Monitoring Program. And so these were where they deployed um, YSI SONs and sensors um, from docks and other physical structures on the shoreline. And they were deployed at, um, I think, what's amassed to almost 130 stations over the past 10 or 15 years. Um, these sensors are mostly deployed from sort of the March to October period, um, but they're recording every 15 minutes. And again, the only part of the carbonate system being measured here is pH. Um, and a lot of these stations were on a three-year rotation where they'd be deployed in one place for three years and then moved to another place. But there's other stations that have been um, 
readily monitored for a decade now. So there's this at least a rich um, data set for pH um, here. And just to give you an example of that and what that tells us about the potential for variability in the estuaries, this is a I'm going to highlight some data from the Corsica River, um, which is a fairly shallow and eutrophic creek on the Chester River in the upper Chesapeake Bay. And these here are time series from that continuous record. Um, the blue here is pH and the black is dissolved oxygen. And I've just regressed all of those data against one another to show um, what we sort of all know, that these two variables tend to be um, related to one another in time due to the diol cycles of photosynthesis and respiration. Um, but, and I admit that I picked an extreme site to sort of make this point, but um, you can see just the extreme variability that's measured here um, with both oxygen and pH where over the course of a day occasionally you're moving um, from sort of fully, for not fully, but oversaturated to near anoxic and pH is varying by, you know, in some cases one and a half to two units. So it's pretty remarkable some of this exchange or variability. And so you know, some of the things that we've looked at here, which are also sort of telling about the dynamics in estuaries, is we've looked at sort of just quantifying the relationship between the change in O2 and the change of pH, and um, looking at the slope of that, that correlation and how strongly um, these two relate to one another. And if, for all these 130 stations, if you regret, if you look at the solidity of those, um, versus the slope of that oxygen to pH change, you can see that the slope um, gets increasingly large as you get into the more freshwater systems. Um, that speaks to the, the buffering changes that occur along salinity gradients. So th there's a r rich data set here and um, there's a lot of synthesis that can be done with it. So the next part that the next set of slides I created are focused on what I call investigator based monitoring. And th these dots are just representative from a, a summary that Grace has put together of some of the efforts that are going on in the Mid-Atlantic and some extras that I added based on some publications that I'm familiar with. So there's a lot of um, different types of projects that have focused on um, the carbonate system and the OA problem uh, here, and I'll sort of talk about a couple of those. So. Whitman Miller shared these two slides with me and he's deployed a system to measure CO2 um, continuously um, off two piers in the Chesapeake region, which I should say are indicated by these white boxes here. And if you look on the bottom here, this is just a representative time series um, from July of uh, 2014. And like I pointed out with the first slide, you can just see how variable um, the sort of diol signal is um, for CO2. Um, reaching, um, you know, peaks and troughs that are pretty high um, in one day. And what's also interesting about this is that the CO2 is also just fairly high um, in, in this place. So it's um, it's an interesting um, system. So to compare that, um, he's also deployed it off the Chesapeake Biological Laboratory Pier, um, which is down here. It's sort of near the mouth of where the Patuxent River enters into Chesapeake Bay. And so you can see, again, a lot of variability, but you don't see necessarily the strong diol cycle. Um, it looks like there's some fortnightly dynamics happening here. And again, this is looking at the month of June um, in 2015. And so at this pier, um, we have a monitoring system off the pier, and there's a system measuring oxygen there. And sorry for my really sloppy figure overlays, but it's what I could put together. But you can see where you have this um, really high CO2 is a time when you have um, oxygen under saturation. And these two things sort of move opposite one another, which is what we would expect. So there's sort of, we're measuring um, real processes, but dynamics over both sort of diol cycles and fortnightly cycles. And if you just overlay the salinity, which is in green, you can see that there is sort of a strong decline in salinity from around 14 to around 12 over the same period. So um, this just speaks to the influence of freshwater input from precipitation and freshwater flow um, that um, drives some of these dynamics um, over sort of the, the fortnightly seasonal time scale. 
So the last uh, piece of this is just to talk about what I've called investigator-based research sampling. And these are some of the efforts that have mapped at least uh, Delaware and Chesapeake Bay. Um, Wajun Size Group has been instrumental in this, but there's been many others that have been involved. Um, Elizabeth Shadwick is starting up some efforts um, in the southern parts of Chesapeake Bay. And um, so there's been a fair amount of work in these regions as well. And so just to give you a flavor of some of that, um, those results, um, these are from one of Wei Jun's cruises recently, and this is a sort of transect of PCO2 in the Chesapeake Bay. And you can see that there's this strong sort of supersaturation in the upper part of the bay that tends to be turbid and receives a lot of the inputs from the Susquehanna River. Um, but as you move seaward, um, the CO2 drops down quite a bit and you have sort of this, um, at least a, a bay-wide, a little bit of a minimum in the middle there. And if you compare that to patterns of dissolved oxygen supersaturation, you can see that you have this region here where you have sort of a CO2 minimum and uh, oxygen supersaturation peak. And so there's obviously clear patterns spatially um, in these dynamics. And what's interesting about this as well is that a lot of reviews have indicated that estuaries are probably CO2 sources to the atmosphere. Um, but in these bigger eutrophic systems like Chesapeake Bay, there's apparently large regions of them, which I think we expected that um, are potentially CO2 sinks um, because of the high productivity and um, relative release from a lot of the terrestrial inputs um, further upstream. So the last thing I'll share is um, just sort of an interesting dynamic we've observed. Um, so these are some data from a station in the middle part of the Chesapeake Bay this summer where you have oxygen on the left and pH and salinity over depth. And you can see that um, where the picnic line exists, where salinity is changing a lot, there's a fairly clear oxygen and pH minimum that's occurring right around the picnic line. And so this is not a feature that's received a lot of attention and one that um, we've been working on. And Wei Jun has a paper that's sort of within the publication process now sort of looking at this. And so a quick little result of that is um, if you look at dissolved O2 and pH um, at one station in the Chesapeake Bay that's nearly anoxic, um, this blue line here is the first couple days Wei Jun's group visited it, and you can see this strong picnic line and that there's really low dissolved oxygen um, and that pH sort of smoothly drops down. But after a mixing event um, where oxygen was sort of mixed up a little bit further in the water column, um, you can see the pH sort of drop down and there'd be a little bit of a pH minimum in this picnic line area, which um, is associated with probably a number of things, but there's a lot of solutes um, in the bottom here in this anoxic region um, that can be oxidized and have effects on pH. So there's a lot of interesting dynamics over a lot of different space and time. So just to summarize, um, I'll follow along on sort of Janet's summary. Um, what do we know? Well, there's a wealth of monitoring data in the mid-Atlantic estuaries, um, and there's a lot of new research activities, but traditionally the carbonate system data has been fairly limited. And I just stole a quote from Whitman Miller in an email um, that he sent to me, which is, given the huge number of water quality monitoring stations and opportunities, this some strategic carbonate chemistry measurements um, could bring us up to speed pretty quickly. So. Given all that we know about so many aspects of the biogeochemistry, we might be able to be smart about where new efforts are made. Um, and from time series of pH and alkalinity, those that exist, um, three to four decades of this data um, can be constructed to look at other um, aspects of the carbonate system. And where the pH has been looked at, there's interesting spatially dependent trends in pH, in, at least in Chesapeake Bay. Um, and that in estuaries, at all of the scales that have been investigated to date, whether it be sort of horizontal, vertical, diel, seasonal, decadal, um, there's significant variability um, in the OA parameters um, at all of these time scales. So it's clearly um, a challenge to understand, but also a lot of opportunities to learn um, here. And so secondly, sort of what do we know and how can we achieve these desired goals? Um, I think this is a very open-ended question and there's a lot of answers. Um, but clearly the inter interaction between eutrophication and the sort of fossil acidification signal 
um, is clearly one we need to understand better in estuaries. Um, you know, one might ask um, how vulnerable key organisms are in these dynamic environments. You know, how adaptable are things like oysters and different benthic organisms that have been exposed to, probably been exposed to high variability um, in something like pH for a long time. And then I sort of leave it open to what else. I mean, clearly there's some gaps in the data and some challenges to synthesis, but there's also a lot of opportunities. So, um, yeah, I'll just leave this slide to finish, and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, Jeremy and Janet, we do have a couple questions from the audience. Um, there's a question from Judith Weiss, and she's wondering if you've come across any of the monitoring data in the New York and New Jersey Harbor Estuary. Um, I have not, but uh, to be honest, I haven't looked um, very hard. And so I, I forgot to say that. I think that GRACE has been trying to put together a list of all the monitoring programs that exist and all the available data, um, but that's very much a work in progress as I understand it. Um, so I think this, you know, one goal of this effort in this webinar might be to start to um, hear from other people about what other data streams are available. Hi, this is Grace. I'm just going to add to that um, question, or that I guess Jeremy's answer. Yes, it is very much a work in progress, and if I haven't contacted anybody on the webinar directly about available data, and you have some, now it's a good time to let me know. Um, we're trying to put together a static map showing all the monitoring efforts in the Mid-Atlantic region, so um, if we don't if we don't know about it, it's not going to be on there. And obviously, the more the more we know, the better. So thank you. All right, um, we have another question from Beth Turner, um, and this is in response to Whitman Miller's quote: "What would constitute being up to speed?" Is there any idea what spatial and temporal resolution will be needed to get sufficient information? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I think there's probably a number of people on this call or in the community that um, should be asked that question in addition to me. Um, but, and you know, I guess my, my first reaction is I hate to say this, um, but sort of one of the things I tried to point out in the slides is that there, there's variability sort of at every time and space scale that we look. Um, so, you know, some combination of mapping, which is increasingly doable, um, with sensor deployments, which the technology seems to be there now, and there's at least going to be three or four places in the bay that will sort of capture um, that real-time monitoring. And the, and the key thing about that is that we have sort of that will capture a seasonal cycle, but it also capture some of these short-term things that um, aren't necessarily easy to capture. So some of um, the previous work has really emphasized that wind events um, can cause big changes and potentially degassing events um, just due to the mixing. And that um, there's other features of circulation in estuaries that aren't necessarily straightforward and linear and that we, we learn about those and how important they are by having those sensors out there. Um, but, but I think to more specifically address Whitman's quote is that I think we can look at things like oxygen and sort of determine the where the biggest signals are, and perhaps more importantly, where the biggest vulnerabilities are. And that might be where we need to sort of focus some monitoring to, to look at where, um, you know, things like aragonite and saturation state are, um, are, are vulnerable to, to being in a place where they're not desired. So I think that's how I interpreted his quote, is that we would use it to, to find the places that we need to sort of understand the most. If I could add to that, um, I would say that, that NOAA OA buoys uh, are monitoring pH and CO2 um, at a scale of every three hours. 
So with those data sets, we're able to look at everything from you know, wind gusts to, well, maybe not gusts, but short-term wind changes to tidal, um, longer-term decadal change, uh, the Gray's Reef mooring off of south in the South Atlantic Bight is up over a, a, a decade at this point, slightly over a decade of data at this point. So once we get longer term time series, and even from interpolated time series and those that are filled in, uh, gap filled with model data, so we can start to look at everything from tides to uh, synoptic scale. Uh, atmospheric changes that are related to El Nino and North Atlantic oscillation. So coming from my point of view, you can't have a short enough time scale and you can't ever have too much data. So the more the merrier. All right. There's a couple more questions that have come in. Um, there's a, a question from Emily Rivest, or Rivest. Are there any data resources available for carbonate chemistry data that have paired biological data sets? Might this also be a part of coming up to speed in addition to the additional carbonate chemistry measurements? Or is that beyond the scope of the MACAN? Well, as far as I know, uh, there is no data set yet that uh, pairs all of those, or I would say a large data set yet that pairs all of those. Um, I think in, in, in terms of the synthesis that's needed, that's high on the list of priorities is something like a World Ocean Atlas that has not only OA and carbonate data, but other biological measures and they do happen to know that there are uh, projects that are being, or proposals that are being written that would address just that issue. Hi, this is great. I'll add a little bit more to that. Um, I've been compiling this kind of list of monitoring efforts. There wasn't a lot of biological data listed when people sent me the parameters that were measured. Um, chlorophyll might have been, you know, probably it for biological. Um, but that being said, there are, you know, like the NOAA surveys that um, Nathan Rebuck's been leading, um, you know, they go out during the NOAA Ecomon cruises that they're doing the fishery surveys. So there, there is paired data. It's just a matter of now it needs to be synthesized with the, with the OA data. There's another question from Julie. Are there efforts to tease apart the natural fluctuations in pH from the anthropogenic cause changes? And are there any thoughts on how this could be done if that has not already been done? So one effort that I'm involved in is that, you know, we're building um, numerical models to do simulations that will allow us to, um, you know, do some nutrient loading scenarios and also some sort of acidification scenarios if you want to call them that. And so the models are, are one way um, to sort of do scenario based work that would help tease out the natural variability to the sort of longer term um, effect of acidification. And you know one of the challenges to that is if, if you have enough data where you can look at these shallow systems that are um, spatially pretty dense, you can see, you know, every flavor of variability in, say, oxygen and pH from something that doesn't vary that much and seems to be really impacted by the tides to stations that um, are completely dominated by the production respiration cycle um, in a dramatic way. And so um, I think there are, there's probably some quantitative methods that could be done, but, you know, the one way that we aim to do it is to do, is to go the route of the numerical model. All right, we have a couple other um, comments. Um, Matt Gove, 
um, who is with Surfrider, says that Surfrider currently tests for bacteria at various coastal areas within the Mid-Atlantic using citizen science volunteers, usually on a weekly basis. Would acidification data collected through these efforts be helpful in plugging data gaps, or does the data need to be taken further offshore or at shorter intervals? Um, if I may, I think that uh, we have uh, the SciLab has been able to in, uh, involve uh, a bit of citizen science, and we have CO2 uh, and pH sensors on uh, vehicles of opportunity. But as far as going out and taking water samples or uh, using equipment sensors, it's much more difficult because of collection requirements for what we would consider climate quality data. Um, we have tried in the past and not, we're not sure yet if we've been successful because again, those data haven't been synthesized yet or uh, compared with uh, what we do know of climate quality data. So I, I think it's, um, it's certainly a direction that would increase our spatial and time coverage. It's just there are a lot of uh, details to be worked out that would have to be done on an individual basis, most likely. Hi, this is Grace. I just wanted to add to that also. There is a company, I think they're called SmartFin, that is trying to, they might have already integrated a pH sensor into their surfboard fins. Um, and I, I think they're, you know, going about the citizen science route in order to collect that pH data. Um, I don't know what, I, I should look that up because I have, it's been a while since I've heard about it. I don't know what stat, what the status is. I, I'm pretty sure it's been made and they're, they've tested it out. Um, so I know that there's at least something started with that, Matt. I just don't know what the, what the status is. We have another question from uh, Talmaj. We are doing. We are talking about capturing and data mashing a series of data points. Is there a what if of desired data to capture and state of the art capture technology? Hi, this is Grace. Um, I think that's an excellent question for our workshop in May. <laughs> Um, that's those are exactly the types of questions that you know we want to discuss with a bigger group with stakeholders natural resource managers and you know researchers to try to get some of those answers I don't know if Jeremy or Janet have anything else to add to that Does anyone have any more questions? We have we still have about five more minutes of time with our speakers. There was a comment that came in uh, from Beth Phelan. Uh, she works at Sandy Hook and wanted to point out that the transects that Janet mentioned in the ocean margins cruise and ECOA are in two different places that have different oceanographic conditions. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, but at this time, we are pretty limited on, uh, you know, high spatial resolution data. So we kind of have to take what we have and interpret it the best that we can. Uh, there's another ECOA cruise that's planned. I'm sorry, I don't remember if it's. 2017 or 18, um, but as you know, one of the things that we learned from the GOMEX uh, and then the first ECOA cruise is that the, we need better spatial coverage, and we just don't have the means to do that at present, at least with in, in terms of space. But uh, the NOAA OA buoys, I with more coming online, I guess, every couple of years, or at least we have a better handle on uh, time, uh, 
variability in the time spectrum. Those are just natural challenges that we deal with in sensor-based uh, science. We have a question from Doug Wilson, and I'm going to try to unmute him and see if he can ask it himself. So let's see how this goes. Doug, I am not actually able to unmute you using the webinar software. So if you can type in your question, we can pose it um, to our panelists. While Doug is typing his question, we do have a question from Julie Reichert about the May workshop. She's wondering if the, um, if the workshop is invitation only or if anyone can register. Hi, this is Grace. Um, no, it's not invitation only. It will be open to everyone. So we'll, we'll make the announcement once we get the logistics set and we have somewhere where everybody can register. Um, then we'll send that information out to the MACAM listserv. If you're not on that listserv and you're on this webinar and you want to be added, let myself or Katie know. Um, and then, you know, if you think of anybody else that's interested in, in either the workshop or becoming a MACAN member, let us know. Um, so anyway, we will get that information out and we'll try to advertise for that workshop, um, you know, far and wide. And this is Katie. I'll just jump in to add that um, we, we will be space limited, though. So once you know that you'll be able to attend, please do register as soon as we uh, send the word around. All right, Doug, if you want to email your question to us, we can pose it to our speakers after the fact. Um, I know you um, are unable to type in your question at this time. All right, any other questions for the audience? We have a question from Elizabeth Zimmerman. What would be the ideal sampling rate or duration for collecting ocean acidification data? Uh, personally, I would love you know, an hour, like hourly data, but you know, in a perfect world, it's not going to happen. Um, I, I don't think that there is a necessarily ideal. It just depends on what you're trying to capture as far as time goes. Uh, but anything that would anything under like six hours that allows us to capture tidal cycles, especially in an estuary setting. I think is is best. Um, you know, there's some sensors that will get you every two minutes, and what you do with that, you end up um, averaging it usually to half hour hourly data anyway. So it's just it depends on you know how much you want to torture yourself with uh, loads and loads of data. But I, I'm personally would be really happy with hourly. Maybe Jeremy has another opinion on that. Well, I think part of the answer, too, sort of depends on what your question is and what your priority is. Um, I, I, I agree that, you know, the sensor technologies are going to give us the time scale, you know, the fine time scales we need to capture all of the primary modes of variability, you know, tides, PR, seasonal, um, and even interannual if they're deployed long enough. Um, you know, but if you're working in a big system that has a lot of variability and you can't deploy f five or six sensor platforms, then you may have to give up on some of that high temporal variability to sort of capture spatial variability. So I guess yeah, it not only depends on what your question is, but also um, you know what your resources are in terms of that. I mean, perhaps that's obvious, but. All right, if there are no more questions, I'm going to turn it back over to Grace and Katie to wrap up this session. Thank you.
thank you, Jeremy and Janet, for your presentations today. And thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, stay tuned for the next webinar four weeks from now. <laughs>